This will be our 22nd lesson in the book of Ephesians. <clears throat> the second chapter is a particularly rich and foundational chapter. The third is also. And uh, it's important to, to grasp what is being said in these texts. Now, the matter of our salvation, it must be understood correctly. It's not enough to have a flawed view of salvation. And you will, if you have trafficked in a Christian environment of any sort, you will soon find out that there's not much really known about salvation among professing Christians. And this is, a, it's more than a sad situation. It's a very dangerous situation because eternal life is the knowledge of God. And the knowledge of God is most specifically stated and enlarged in his salvation. So that if you do not understand salvation, you do not understand God and it doesn't make any difference to try and explain it. you do. You don't. That's just all there is to it. If the most extensive revelation of God is found in his salvation as ministered through the only begotten Son, then there's no greater deterrent in possessing the knowledge of God than to be ignorant of that salvation. Now, that ought to be plain enough, but it, unfortunately a lot of people don't see it that way at all, but that's the way it is. God is in the process of revealing himself. And to do that, he has invested more of himself in his salvation than he has in anything else of, available to men. And there's, there's sense in salvation. There's a holy logic in it. There's a reasonability in it. There's the character of God is in it. And if you don't understand it, you're just dead. <laughs> There's no other way to say it. You may have a lot of hype and things like that, but it's just artificial, it's not real. And Satan won't back off from you. If you don't know God, Satan won't back off from you. He'll be very bold toward you, and you'll not be able to do a thing about it. If God doesn't undertake somehow on your behalf to ward him off, you'll just be a victim. That's all there is to it. The salvation of God is not the result of what man does plus what God does. Amen. Or what God does plus what man does. If the results, it is not the result of both human and divine input. Is it possible that God enables the one who is saved to do what is required of them? Well, yes, indeed it is. That's a great key to understanding. Some of us live for some time in Christ before we knew just a simple thing is it was given to you to believe. We weren't taught that. We didn't know that. Our system of theology didn't acknowledge that. There was no place for that. Then we found out that's the way it was. That was quite a, <laughs> quite a revelation. It's quite a revelation when you found out that Jesus gave you repentance. Amen. Yeah, we weren't taught that. We're, some of us, our background, we weren't taught that. That was, uh, if you said something like that, they said you were a Calvinist mm -hmm. or something of that sort, used in a derogatory manner. Of course, none of them had ever read anything Calvin said, but they felt at liberty to speak about it anyway. There is, in the matter of salvation, appropriating salvation and man maintaining salvation, there's a phenomenal amount of confusion on the subject and a lot of debating that goes on back and forth, arguing about how you appropriate salvation, does it have to be maintained, is it maintained automatically, once you obtain it, is it locked, are you locked in forever? See, there's all kind of chatter about these things, but uh, it's wasted time. Paul doesn't get caught up in arguments about this. He just states the case the way it is. 
So we're going to see there's some things that are preeminent that is they rise to the top. Things about the salvation of God. Things that are their mainstays. So far as perception is concerned, they're the most significant. So far as stability is concerned, they're the foundation. So far as safety is concerned, they're what the bulwark of what strengthens it. Salvation is no stronger than the means God uses to maintain it. That defines how sure it is, how strong it is. Say, well, God provides everything. Yes, he does, but it has to be obtained. Amen. It comes through the channel of faith. If your faith is weak and constricted, not much gets through. Even in the world, if you have a line that brings you something and the line gets clogged up, if you're sending something out, it doesn't go out. Right. And if you're bringing something in, it doesn't come in. So if you do not maintain your faith, if your faith is restricted, if it's hard to believe, then it's hard to receive. It's hard to send anything to God like a prayer or praise or anything like that. So the perception of this is going to be elaborated on in this text tonight. Ephesians 2, 6 and 7. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. I think we're covering verse 8 too, I'm not sure. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. Now let's look at the first word here in verse 7. That. Very key word. That he hath raised us up. The previous verse states what we were, quickened together with Christ, who were dead in trespasses and sins. That is going to tell us why God did that. Regarding divine purpose, when Jesus raised from the dead, all of his people were raised with him from the standpoint of purpose. His death counted for their death, his resurrection counted for their resurrection. Together means that all the saints are raised together in divine purpose. As far as God's intention and purpose was a concern, objective, all of them were raised together, all, all of them were raised. But that's not the point of this text. Here the point is, is the experience of being raised. That's the point. Now the experience is based upon this reality that when whatever was done to Christ was done to all people. If they died, all of them died. If one died for all, then all are dead. If he is raised, then all are raised. But the experience of that now is what he's talking about. The experience is based upon the reality. The contact with Christ is at the point we come to in contact with Christ. That's the point at which the experience of salvation commences. Amen. If there's no contact, experiential, real contact with Christ, yet none, salvation isn't, isn't inaugurated not on the experiential level at all. It was made with, the contact with Christ was made when we were baptized into his death. That's where we contacted Christ, in his death. Through faith, we experienced what happened when Christ died. 
and we were knit together in Christ in his death, that union produced the raising of reverence. If, you, if a person didn't die with Christ, they were not raised with him. I want to be emphatic about this. Death to Christ is death to sin and death to the world. It's developed in Romans, the sixth chapter. And if a person did not die with Christ, it doesn't make any difference if they went through what they call baptism or not. God did not raise him. God raises the dead. And if a person is not dead, God does not raise them. Now, this is my private opinion, what I'm telling you. But I think there are an enormous amount of professed Christians that never were risen with Christ. Yeah. It, certainly get that impression, at least. Yeah, there's no, there's no evidence of it, not any adequate evidence, shall we say. Somehow people have taken this for granted. See, Paul's not taking this for granted. He's not taking it for granted because you went through an ordained form that you said you were raised, you just were raised. Oh. In that form of baptism, the form of the doctrine, if you did not contact Christ's death, which is contingent upon your frame of mind and spirit and your faith, if you did not have faith in the operation of God, then all you were were don't. That's all. We already know the said that there is a form with no power. No power, that's right. This is a very sensitive thing, in particular in circles that I came from, but it has to be said. Amen. He has raised us up. He has raised us up together. With Christ, together with Christ. Not together with one another, together with Christ. Amen. He raised us up because we died with Christ. The scriptures say, if you be dead with Christ... They shall live. If we be, if we die with him, we shall also live with him. That's what the scriptures affirm. Thus it is written, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. That's not talking about eternity. That's talking about after you were baptized. We believe if we were dead with Christ, we will live. See, that's faith in the operation of God. It's Colossians 2.12, and it's delineation of baptism. He says we were baptized by baptism and, and faith in the, and risen by faith in the operation of God. So we voluntarily, because we heard you, you, you can't be worldly and go to heaven. You just can't. That's all there is to it. You have to be delivered from the world. It's not really easy to be delivered from the world if you don't take God into the picture. When you died with Christ, that's what happened. We're delivered from the world and raised with Christ into a new domain. Yes. I, I like that. You know, that's where we. That's where the opera, operation of God takes place. That's right. Now, you. You know, men are divided over this faith and baptism. Yeah. But see, and you made the point clear, uh, it works together. You can you can be baptized without faith, God can't raise you, or you can you can have faith and not be baptized. But see, we're we're uh, it's both of them both where we contact yeah, Christ. Right. And I, I bring that out because right. you know well uh, the the background I come from, you know, where men and they still do. Oh yeah. Fight about this. Yeah, but see, it makes perfect sense now. Yes. See, actually, those who accentuate baptism, I just wrote a little, a little article on that, the over-evaluation of baptism. There are a number of things associated with baptism. He that believeth and is baptized, that's believing. Repent and be baptized. We dead with Christ, we'll live with him, and so forth. But there are people that exalt, they eliminate the, the and, the the believing that they don't talk about that, the repenting they don't talk about that, they don't talk about being dead to the world. They just they just talk about the baptism. Well, this is this is incorrect. 
people. Oh, yeah. They're yep. wrong to. Because they, yeah. they, they haven't repented. If they don't believe, then they're not a candidate to be baptized. There have been a few people that I've, I've refused to baptize. Not many, thank God. But One lady or her brother brought her. When he'd been talking to her, she decided to be baptized. We met at night at the building. She wanted a private baptism. The first thing I talked to her about is I don't like private baptisms. That's not the way to get started, unless you're in a desert someplace. So that's, that's of course, something else. She said, well, I'll tell you, if, he didn't, if my brother didn't want me to be baptized, I wouldn't be baptized. I said, you just well pack your clothes and go home because I'm not baptizing you. Oh, she got pretty hot. And I said, well, you know, I think I'm bigger than you, so you don't, I'm not baptizing you. Unless you repent and you want to be, not going to do it. The church needs to be non-insistent about this. Sometimes there's bodies of people, young people that come forward, and they don't have any idea what's going on. They need to be told about this. We're knit to Jesus in his death, and that produced the raising of reverence. That, that's what causes us to be raised from the dead. This is another way of just saying we were delivered from the present evil world and translated into the kingdom of God's dear sons. That's, that's the same thing, just from a little different viewpoint. Another way of saying God put us in Christ. Of God are we in Christ Jesus, 1 Corinthians 1.30. Paul means that the together part is God joined us together with Jesus. We didn't join Jesus. Technically, Jesus joined us. Died and your life is now hidden, hidden with Christ. Christ. In God. That's right. You know, you have to be dead to be with Him. That's right. Because He's dead to the world. He's not here anymore. Yeah, you know, makes perfect sense. And He's made us. I like this. I like the way he talks. You pick up this language here. It just is very edifying. He made us sit together with him in heavenly places. He made us. That doesn't mean, that does that mean forced us. Is that not what it means? It means he accomplished it. I like the word accomplished better. He accomplished it. Made us sit together with Christ in heavenly places. In other words, we, we died with Jesus. He didn't remain in the grave, <laughs> so neither did you. Amen. You were raised up to sit with him in heavenly places. Now our text is going to tell us why that all took place. It's very, very edifying. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Heavenly places, don't think of it as a location exactly. That's not what he's emphasizing here. He has told us just in verse 3 of chapter 1 that he had put, he had put all, he had blessed us with all spiritual blessings in Christ Jesus in heavenly places. Right? So that what he's saying is he put us where the resources are. That's, that's the point. Amen. Raise us up together with Christ and put us where the resources are. So whatever's required... To maintain this life that we now have in Christ Jesus is there. Where, where God put us is there. If we do not maintain it, it's not because the resources weren't available. That's not why. Because we didn't avail ourselves of the resources. Something happened that we, we left that environment. That's what happened. That's what happens when a person falls away, they leave the environment. Just like the first angels left their first habitation. Hmm? What it says of them does, it says they left their first habitation. That's what a person who falls away does. He leaves, or she leaves, where God had put them. Is that serious? Well, the devil didn't have any chance to get back. That's how serious it was for him and the angels. Yes, it is. Uh, it is serious. He has made us sit together with Christ in heavenly places where all the resources are. Now, this union can't be perceived by the flesh. This isn't something you can see. I don't care how holy you are, you can't see this. 
but you can experience this even though it cannot be seen here's why I did this that other versions read in order that so that the new read by standard version two he raises two this was to, so God can, for to, and now God wanted, God did this so that, and he did this too. In other words, raising you up and making you sit together with Christ in heavenly places was not an end of itself. Amen. As grand as that is, and as superlative as that is, that was in order to something else. How's that? That's what the word that means. It's a word that stands between something that happened in order that something of greater import can happen. <laughs> he did one thing in order that he might do something else that had a greater significance than being set together with Christ in heavenly places. If it's not, if that was the greatest, then everything would have stopped there. And there would have been no further, no further involvement with Christ. Just we'd be settled right there. But we didn't settle there. We're not out. Of, we're not out of the gunshot of jeopardy yet. For example, He saved us so He could make us alive. He had to get rid of our sin before He could make us alive. Amen. He had to sever our connection to sin. Our our love of it, our preference of it, we had to separate it so that before he could make us alive. So he forgave your sins. That wasn't like the end of the matter. That wasn't just like what he wanted to get done and forgive your sin. He had to make you alive, but to make you alive, this had to take place. Your sins had to be forgiven. You had to die with Christ, and you had to be raised up in order to obtain the objective God wanted to achieve. He made us alive so he could set us with Christ in heavenly places. See, it's always, the, it's in order to something that, as long as we're in the world, we're in the in order to yeah. phase of salvation. There's something further to yet be experienced. Amen. About the time you think you peaked out, <laughs> there's more to come. Amen. Yeah, but Bob. I took the kids to an expensive restaurant once. But they had an appetite for grilled cheese sandwiches. That's really what <laughs> yeah. they wanted. They didn't really know where they were at. They didn't know what they had. And all everyone around them is experiencing these wonderful tastes. And they want grilled cheese. I thought, that's just like in the kingdom. Yeah, it is. <laughs> in other words, God is bringing us by phases to glory. He does this in order that he might do that, in order that he might do that, in order that he might do that, until finally... We end up at the throne. That's how far we fell, brother. <laughs> That's how far sin took us away from God. We got to go up to him and sin step by step, so to speak, stage by stage, glory to glory. And you don't move to the next stage till you fin got this stage straightened out. If the stage to having regular concourse to God means you have to have a true heart till you get that true heart. You don't have access to God. You can't really come into the presence of God. Amen. Not in the sense that you want to. You can't do it. So this is how God works. This is God's manner, see? It isn't that today you're lost, now you're saved, rah, rah, it's all over. That's not so. There have been many a Christian that's fallen because they had a really really good feeling hot oil on the head running down to the feet the next day the hot oil was gone See, what I'm telling you is every state every time you experience some elevated status it's in order that you might go higher and further and deeper every time Sometimes a person gets so used to being in a dead, lifeless environment that a little little joy comes in and they think, whoo, boy, I got it now. And they think, they, no, you haven't. You just got a little bit of it. 
table, the table's not full yet. In order that there's more involved, in other words, than the here and now. As long as you're here and it's now, you got to keep looking ahead. And he mentions, he says that, in order that, in the ages to come. Whoa. Some versions say the coming ages or the time to come or the ages that are coming or for all time. What's he mean when he say for the ages? So what he meant was all the time periods upon the earth. So that all through the earth's history, what God is going to say he's going to do, with he be able to do it. Well, that might sound nice, but it's not. I want to show you why that can't be. He can't be talking about ages on earth or ages in time. It's true that God's showing the power and effectiveness of his grace in time. It's true that he can do this, but it's little, if ever, seen. And the point of this text is that it's seen, not just that it happens, it's that it's seen. I can tell you, you can experience the greatest spiritual experience you ever had and you try and explain it to someone out of Christ and they don't have the faintest idea what you're talking about. There's nothing that evidences that you experience something like this. It's just not made known on the earth level. So I'm saying that in the ages to come, what he's going to do, this can't be talking about ages in the world because there's a tremendous limitation on how much God can show and if he shows it, can it be seen? We know God's purpose is an eternal purpose. So this has to do with some, something that's eternal. If it's an eternal purpose, it can't be fulfilled in time. It's an eternal purpose. God's already done many mighty works on the earth. It's a, and in some cases, it's just about destroying this place. That's right. How can we think that the summation of these things that he's doing in his people is something yeah. of the earth? That's right. Yeah, you'd be surprised. A lot of the translations and a lot of the commentators think that this is what it says. That the ages to come are the periods of time on the earth. Also, the audience is too small and the audience too obtuse to do what he's going to do. The ages to come have more to do with eternity than time. They postulate or are built upon an audience that will be able to perceive the greatness of what's made known to them. Yeah, that's the glory. God's, God's going to have an audience that will perceive what he's, what he's doing. No more could be displayed to mortals than was existent before their eyes. Yeah. Whatever God shows to mortals, particularly unregenerate mortals, what your eyes see and your ears hear, that's, that's the extent <laughs> of what God can show a person. Stars, moon, sun, you know. But when it comes to the display of the grace of God in a magni as a magnificent trophy, we're speaking of an whether we're speaking of an individual, we're not speaking of an individual, but we're speaking about us and together with Christ and the body of Christ. So we're not talking about what God does for the individual. We're talking about something God's going to do with the entire body of Christ. That's the point that... That's the point that he's making. Because what God has to show can't be shown by a person or a small group of people or even an individual church or even a whole denomination or even a church of a whole age. What God has to show is more than that's capable of showing. It has to be bigger than that. See, the church is referred to as the body of Christ, the fullness of him that fills all in all. So whatever he's talking about here, that in the ages to come, he might, we're going to read, he might show, it has to do with what he's going to show in the entire redeemed body. Now, some people think that the entire body is going to be raptured, then it's going to be a great tribulation on earth with the church absent. And some people are going to actually be converted with the Holy Spirit absent and the gospel withdrawn and so forth. This stuff is taught, brethren, uh, yeah. extensively. This is taught today. And it is simply not true. Yeah. When the church is gone, there's no purpose for the world. Amen. 
The world is like a crib for the church to be developed in. The ultimate eternal display is the foundational reason for our salvation. What's, what he's going to say now, what he's going to say now, is why he saved us. Not because we needed to be saved. We did need to be saved, but that's not why he saved He didn't save us because he needed to be saved, because a lot of people are not going to be saved who needed to be saved. So that's not why he saved us. He didn't save us so we could save others. Nothing wrong with that I might by all means save all, that save some. There's nothing wrong with that, but that's not the purpose for which you were saved. Here it is. That, in order that, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness to us through Christ Jesus. That in the ages to come, he might do that. He might show. Some versions say, make clear. He might exhibit, that's the Jerusalem Bible. Might display, that's the Holman Bible. The Living Bible says, can always point to us. And the Apostolic Bible says, to demonstrate. There's something that happened when we are joined to Christ, there's something that happened that has not yet been put on display. That, brethren, is why people can argue about it. That's why people can be divided over salvation. It has not yet been put on display. That's why people can fuss about grace and debate about grace and have different views of grace. It's because it has not yet been put on display. But God's going to put it on display and it's going to end all debate forever. There's not going to be any argument about what grace can do when he puts it on display with the aggregate body of Christ. See, such an action can't be fulfilled in this present world. Things like making clear, exhibiting, displaying, pointing to, demonstrating. See, that's something that can't be done in this present world. Who'd see it if God did it? It ought to be clear that at this time, for at the time, this time, what has been done in God's Son doth not yet appear what it doth not yet appear what we shall be. So what had really happened when you come into Christ has not yet been put on display. You can see some facets of it if you've got eyes to see. But you, the half has not been told. Amen. You can pick out the most godly person you know and you just have seen a very infinitesimal portion yes. of what God has actually done. Amen. Only what is possible to reveal in a sinful environment, which is not much. Jesus speaks about having a joy unspeakable. Well, then it's not going to be unspeakable. Well, that's right. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. See, notice what we have here. It does not yet appear. It's also, the world knoweth us not. So if it was displayed, in, in, in measure it is. They can't see it. Someone may come to you and say, I see you're pretty religious. But they'll never come to you and say, I can see that you're a son of God. No one will say that because you can't see that with the eye at all. In fact, the highest ranking members in the church are the apostles, first the apostles, 1 Corinthians 12, 28. They've been appointed to death and made a spectacle to the world. They don't look to the world like apostles someone Jesus sent at all. They're not afraid to blaspheme these men. <laughs> then they set forth Paul said he has set the apostles forth as last and they've been made as the filth of the world and are the off scarring of all things of this day now that's who he's done the most work in but look it had been displayed 
Not yet. You're going to show a finished work. Now the work's in progress. You're going to show a finished work. He's determined to this. That's why he raised you. That's why he raised you and set you in heavenly places together with Christ. In order that in these accumulated people, he's going to display what grace has really done. Amen. That people have thought for thousands of years about grace as something that's weak. But it's not. It's so strong that a little of it is sufficient. Grace is powerful and God's going to show what his grace has accomplished. And he saved us in order that he might do that. Now tell me what bearing that might have on keeping the faith. If you know this, you'll be willing to wait. Oh, the people don't recognize us now. Don't let that bother you. Don't be annoyed over that because the people don't recognize what you have in Christ or don't appreciate you. Don't let that be a source of aggravation to you. God hasn't shown it all yet. So they, they don't recognize. They don't know you. Amen. That's right. <laughs> yeah, God was willing to wait. That's He's right. long suffering. That's right. <laughs> So it's written, now this when God's going to make known. It's going to happen when Jesus is revealed. Because until the, until the Savior is revealed, the saved can't be revealed. See, The Savior's got to be revealed before the saved can be revealed. When he shall appear, then shall we also appear with him in glory. So we can't expect to be recognized by the world if Jesus isn't recognized by the world. But the scriptures tell us that in First. Timothy 6.15, that God is going to show him when he shall appear, then shall we also appear with him in glory. When God shows him in his own times, who is the blessed, who is, is the blessed and only potentate. Let's have done with saying Jesus shall reign. Jesus is coming to reign. Phrases like this, Jesus has been exalted. He is reigning. Who is the one and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords. That's what he is. The world doesn't believe that's what he is. A lot of the church doesn't believe that's what he is. All people that are lukewarm and haphazard in their spiritual life don't believe that's what he is. But that's what he is. And God's going to show it someday. There will not be one dissenting voice. When he does, nobody will fail to bow their knee and confess with the tongue that Christ is Lord. When he shall appear, we shall also appear with him. 1 John 3, 2. He's going to show now at that time when the son is seen as he is, then the saved can be seen as they are. And God's grace can be seen for what it did. In the exceeding riches of his grace, he will be we display the exceeding riches of his grace. Then what has been done will be more clearly perceived. Now we're like little children <laughs> grappling with what really has happened. The exceeding riches, think of how this stated, the exceeding riches riches of his grace it's such a big clause some versions translate the surpassing riches new american standard the niv says incomparable riches the new revised standard says the immeasurable riches the basic bible English says the full wealth the a version says the abundant riches extremely rich grace god's word bible magnitude of the riches murdoch Extraordinarily rich, New Jerusalem Bible. Incredible wealth, New Living Bible. Superior riches, International English. Limitless riches, International Standard Version. Amazing riches, Montgomery. In other words, there's no way to describe this. How great what grace is and what grace does, there's no way to describe how great it is because it 
go, it surpasses human experience. Natural human experience. So if you do experience the working of grace, there's no faculty to express it in nature. But God wants it expressed. God wants it to be seen. So he's appointed a day when he's going to put this on display, what grace has done. I don't doubt there'll be a like a before and an after presentation. What happened? That's why God saved you for this, for this exceeding great display. See, grace is exceeding rich. Oh, it's, it's the choicest part of God's character. The scripture says we were saved by his glory and the virtue. We might say by his best, best attributes, if God may be said to have best attributes. It's the loftiest part of his person. The part that holy angels haven't seen, or cherubim or seraphim. That part of his nature has accomplished salvation. I have not seen nor ear heard what God has prepared for them that love him. God, God's shown it to us, but just the outline like. We just got the table of contents about what it amounts to. Of the whole book, we got the table of contents. That's about it. But he's going to let this thing be made known. <laughs> Angels are going to start to shout when they see what this grace did. They've been in the presence of God for a long time. How long, we have no idea, but for a long period, they've been in God's presence. But they have never seen anything like what the grace of God has done. And it can best be seen not in a person, not in a small group of people, but in the whole body of Christ, conformed to the image of Christ, a perfect, together, a perfect replica of Christ. What did that? Grace did that. <laughs> and his exceeding kindness did that. That's what did that. See? Why do people resort to uh, to law? Because they actually think law can do more than grace. But law can't do more than grace. It can't. It has, there's no comparison between what law can do and what grace can do. No comparison at all. In his kindness toward us, kindness. <laughs> Just to think of God being kind, that's quite a quite a thought to muse upon, just that itself. Paul said, after the love and kindness of God our Savior appeared. That's when we were saved, when his kindness appeared. God is kind. His kindness toward it, directed toward us. Not kindness off there someplace that you speculate about, kindness toward us. Nehemiah said kindness was revealed in God not forsaking wayward Israel. Said he was kind, not forsaking them. He was kind. <laughs> the psalmist spoke of God's merciful kindness. That's an intriguing phrase. Isaiah spoke of God's everlasting kindness. And Joel spoke of his great kindness. The love of the grace of God and his kindness. See, grace does something. It isn't that it is something, it does something. Amen. So we don't, if we want to speak appropriately, we don't say what is grace, we say what does grace do? Yeah. Uh -huh. And we have to say we can, well we know some things grace does, but we're going to have to wait for the full revelation. <laughs> That's how much has been done. Magnificent. And it's through Christ Jesus his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. You take Jesus out of the equation and God is not kind toward us. His kindness is through Christ Jesus. And toward him there's nothing but kindness. At one time his wrath was expended upon the sun, but that, that just lasted about three hours. That was as it. And that's settled the sin matter for God and now kindness. So if you're in Christ, that's, Christ is like exposed to the sunlight of kindness that's beaming on him. 
The further you get away from Christ, the less you think about God's kindness and the less you experience God's kindness. God's kind, like he can take a shepherd boy and make him a king. It's kind to his kindness toward us. Also, God's kindness has transforming power. It's just not an exhibit. It accomplishes something. It sets us apart from, it sets God's kindness apart from all other kindness. You can be kind to a person, but it won't change them. You can see a beggar sitting on the road and he will work for food or whatever, and you give him something, but it doesn't change him. God's kindness changes, and he's going to display this. He's going to display the superlative magnificence of his grace in his kindness toward us. He's going to display what was accomplished by this. Just the fact that God was kind, there's not a potentate in the history of the world that his greatness was based on his kindness. It was always based on his power, his authority, his ability to get things done. Or not. Here's God, his kindness has displayed his greater part. <laughs> How's that? This is the one that made the world, you know. His kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Now, and he makes this statement like a summation statement. Verse 9, 4, by grace are you saved through faith and then not of yourselves. It's the, it's the gift of God. So the thing God has targeted to, dis, to display in the world to come, that's the thing that saved you. <laughs> now it's that. <laughs> in other words, grace is never going to be obsolete. It's always going to be a subject of exposition and of display. God will take the accumulated church called Christ's wife or his bride or his body to put on display and the magnificence of it will have the glory that be characterized by the same kind of glory God has, like a glory of a jasper stone. Right. It'd be likened to a city. The holy city, the Jerusalem coming up, that's the church. That's the glorified church. I'll show you the bride, the lamb's wife. John saw a city coming down. <laughs> that's, what, that's what that city was. It was the bride, the lamb's wife. That's what the city was. It's magnificent for beauty and greatness and God's grace and kindness produced that city. It built that city. That city was built by grace and kindness, and God's going to like open that up. Oh, it's marvelous. By grace you're saved. By grace through faith. So faith is the, what, what plugs you in, in the grace. Everybody has to add that, not of yourselves now. It's not of yourselves. It's not what you did. It's what God did. You, you can't forget that. Not your own doing, not your own accomplishment. This again is disputed among men to this day. Isn't it, aren't the works of God, man involved? They're involved, but not as a foundation, not as a cause. Amen. God doesn't save somebody because they worked. Right. His own hand, even though like you have it, Pictured in Israel or in their deliverance from Egypt, they did a lot of. They did a lot. They had to kill the Passover. Yes. Scripture says that we were made unto good works. That's right, created unto good yeah. works. Yes. Yeah. Had not had it not been for Christ to deliver us, yeah. good works couldn't even come. From That's us. exactly right. Mm -hmm. You take Israel the night they were delivered. All right, they killed the Passover, they ate the Passover with their shoes, feet girded, the shoes on, staff in their hand, ate it with haste. They had to gather all their belongings together, they had to put kneading troughs in their pack, had to make some dough to take along with them, had to ask the Egyptians for certain goods, put blood on the door. There had a lot of things they had to do, but they weren't brought out by any of those things. Those things are not what brought them out. What brought them out was God, and he very carefully states the case. He brought them out. He led them out. 
He delivered them. He saved them all through there. God's very careful to let you know that, yes, they did do a lot. But that's not what they did is not what brought them out. Same with us. To be saved, there are some things you have to do. But it's God that saves you, not what you did that saves you. Someone says, well, what about Peter? He says, save yourselves from this untoward generation. Well, save yourself from this untoward generation. That's Acts 2.40. Save yourself from this untoward generation is quite different than save yourself from death and trespasses and sins. That's, that's quite a bit different. Quite a bit different than that. So salvation is never viewed as a result of human and divine effort. The result of God's effort. Well, you're get ready. Get ready. <laughs> <laughs> Not of works. Human works he's talking about. In other words, you when, when you had F salvation, think of salvation as a large bucket. None of them man's works are in the bucket. Everything that was really effectively done is God did it. So man's works are not in the basic, they're not added to salvation itself. They're not an essential component of the salvation itself. The salvation is wrought by the grace of God and his kindness. That's what wrought the salvation. Then he adds this uh, rather pungent statement. It is the gift of God. Well, what is the gift of God? <laughs> is it the, by grace you say through faith, is that the faith, is that what the gift of God, or is it the whole of salvation? Well, the matter probably is yes. But even some of the versions of Scripture saw the truth of this. The Living Bible says, even trusting is not from yourselves, it is a gift from God. So it, that's how it translated that verse. <laughs> and the NIV says, faith and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. So it seems to me that what God is saying the whole of salvation is from God. But when he speaks about your appropriation of salvation, which is by faith, even that came from God. Yeah. Then, of course, the rest of the scriptures tell us to you, to you it was given to believe and you obtain like precious faith and so forth. So the scriptures develop this in the doctrine, but that's the immediate meaning of the text. That not of yourselves is the gift of God, is the faith by which it appropriates. So God, you are saved... God saved you, and even the means you had of appropriating the salvation, even that was wrought by God. Amen. Where is glory in that? It is excluded. <laughs> if there was any part of us that could have had any part of salvation, then why would God have to take out a stony heart yeah. and put in a heart of flesh? <laughs> That's right. Even well said. I mean, if there's any part of us any good, this, this, there should have yeah, been some good in a stony heart. That's right. You just take out the bad part and leave the good in there. <laughs> yes, that's good. Amen. Would be you need to recreate the person. Anyone else tonight? Go there. There's, there is, there's some something to be seen in the fact that the God that He had to say, "It not of yourselves; it is the gift of God." In that, the, the fact that it, that had to be told us mm -hmm. is is something of a testimony of how far we had to be brought. Oh, by the way, you didn't do this. <laughs> yeah. Amen. Amen. The reason why the works of men aren't on the foundational level is because the promise could not possibly be sure to all the seed. Before well, God has done yeah. what he's Amen. done, he's promised to do what he's done, which Amen. means his name is at stake. Mm -hmm. And God is not going to risk the integrity of his name on the foundation of a human being that is fallible. That's right. Very good. Mm -hmm. Very good. Yeah, we can see the propensity of flesh in um, what Lucifer lifted up himself and it duplicated or replicated that in the, in the garden when men lifted themselves up above God. So this is the nature of the fall, the fallen nature. It's to, to look at self, just to yeah. glorify self, to say, well, but I had something to do with it. Yeah. I did, after all, raise my hand. I went up front. 
I was involved. Are you saying I'm not involved? All these kind of arguments, yeah. but they're all futile at this level. Yes, at this level, it was God that was working in you, both Amen. the will and the do of His, His good, pleasure. good pleasure. That's right. It's just good to acknowledge it, isn't it? It's a great liberty to be able to acknowledge it. Amen. But I think I, I was this way that when I when I contended that men had to do something, I always felt a little uncomfortable doing that. <laughs> yes, with Aaron. Brother Tony said something on the Lord's Day about being uncomfortable with this approach of interpreting the scriptures. Yeah. And I, I, I share in, in that as well, because something that's interpreted that has to be interpreted is something that's foreign to you. Yeah, that's un right. Unfamiliar. Yeah, that's but the right. word, the word of God is engrafted in us. So an interpretation, it, it, approaching it as something that has to be interpreted, I think betrays an unfamiliarity or a foreign a foreign body. Amen. But I think that's where a lot of this comes from. You've, you've mentioned uh, you know, the, the academic, uh, heartless uh, approach to, uh, to the scriptures. That, I think that, that approach is what has given birth to this to these type of Amen. outward views of someone who who is trying to crystallize a view of scripture or a view of salvation without partaking of it themselves. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, Brother Tony. The son, the ages have come has a sound of eternity to me. Amen. Amen. That's what he do. Now this gives us some idea of the magnitude of salvation. Yes it does. You know, uh, like uh, how vast a, a, a body of uh, I don't know of water I want to eat, that we're treading in. I mean, it's just like now the ages. It's going to take the ages to come before God can show. That's right. You know what's we'll really what's really taking place. That's right. You know, and and it's just it's absolutely amazing. It does it does uh, uh, ask of you to you know to uh, put yourself forward. Oh yeah. No. Amen. This also confirms that the activity of God is at the very detail level. Because there's a lot of things that He did in both in preparing the person, leading him to be exposed to the truth, leading him to apprehend the truth, act upon the truth, submit. I mean, there's all <laughs> His grace is in all of that. You know, I listened to a sermon back when we were in Georgia. Uh, I, I can't remember what it was. One of yours, and you was talking about the kindness. It was a renewal, I'm sure, one of them. Anyway, you were talking about the kindness. Never forget, you was talking about the kindness of God <coughs> and uh, the way you was able to deliver it. But you said, now, before God came, we didn't know nothing about kindness. That's right. You know, we didn't know kindness. You went on for a little while with it. Now, the devil didn't know anything about kindness. Oh, no. The devil wasn't kind. Yes, sir. Nobody was kind. There wasn't no kindness until God came. Yeah. Hateful and hating one another, that's what we that's were. Right, yeah. But God, God came in with, and then and it was God that showed us kindness. That's right. It makes us kind. And kindness would be considered by the world a very weak, weak expression that wouldn't really do much. But he's going to say, here's what it did. Yes? But in the thought of, of this not being of yourselves, you know, <clears throat> we even see, we, we see this in Abraham when he tried to fix his own dilemma. And then Ishmael was born, trying to yeah. figure out. But there come a time when Ishmael had to leave the house. Oh well, yeah, yeah. So you know, even his own, even his own, you know, trying to fix his own problem or trying to help God. Basically, he and Sarah were trying to. Yeah. Well, God had see. God didn't reveal to them that Sarah was going to have the child at that time. So they thought about it. They believed God, but this must mean that we have to. We have to do something. Yeah. And God later said, no, no. Ishmael shall, shall not be the heir. Even with the best of intentions, yeah. when men get involved in doing something <laughs> ahead of what God is doing, That's right. it can be, there are going to be problems. I think if you, if you reviewed your own life, you'll find times when you sensed you needed something, you tried to do it yourself, and finally you obtained grace to do it. You, and you'll be able to identify very specific things that God's grace did. God used Ishmael to populate a certain That's portion right. of the world. <laughs> I mean, it was like, it's like from heaven's viewpoint, it's like, oh, that's right on track now. Okay. 
<laughs> All right, we'll have a word of prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we're grateful for the greatness of salvation and that it accrues to your glory. We find ourselves very pleased and satisfied when you're glorified. We've been given to see, Lord, that of you and through you and to you are all things. We give you praise for it. We thank you for the anticipation of the exposition of this marvelous grace and loving kindness throughout the ages to come. Help us, Father, to prepare for it. In Jesus' name, amen.